Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Wananui Kea. Today, we're looking at everyone everywhere, recognition as a person, Article 6, realizing the right to recognition with an amazing international NGO, Franciscans International, and their international advocacy director. Budi, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Joshua. Thanks for the invitation. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights inspires people around the planet to partner together to make an impact. And Article 6 understands everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Can you share with us a bit what first inspired you to care about this issue and campaigns you're involved in? And maybe also initial issues and initiatives that you were participating. Thanks for the questions. As uh, we are human rights organizations, of course, uh, the Universal Declaration has been uh, one of the main source of uh, inspiration for us as a soft law at the international level, as well as a, a, a standard that has been used universally. So we try to uh, be faithful as much as possible with the Universal Declaration. And at the same time, we are also trying to uh, listen to the communities and to the people that we are working with. So it has been very uh, inspiring to uh, understand that although the Universal Declaration has been uh, issued uh, 75 years ago, but the full achievement or implementations of the Universal Declaration is still very challenging even up to today. So therefore, when we speak with uh, uh, the partners, the people in which we are working with, we understand that we still need to really campaign uh, to uh, make this universal declaration understood and be uh, the guidance of uh, not only us, but also for the government authorities so that everyone can have uh, the equal right, the equal uh, opportunity, the equal treatment before uh, uh, the law. So that's uh, very much inspiring uh, us. And, and I think in particular, because we are a Franciscan international organization that has been uh, working mainly with the Franciscan network in different parts of the world, uh, one of our uh, main, uh, uh, let's say, concern is on how to work with those who are marginalized. And often those who are marginalized are those who are really uh, uh, not having uh, the same uh, recognitions or opportunity as other people. So just to give you uh, an, an example on uh, the concrete things that we are doing in the Americas, for example, in particular in the Central America, we are working a lot uh, with the people on the move. Those who are uh, displaced either because of the uh, security situations, uh, because of the climate change situations, or because of poverty, they have to move from one country to another country. And when they come to another country, often they are uh, treated differently or they are marginalized. So that, that, uh, that's why for us, it's quite important for us to work with this kind of people who do not have the same recognitions uh, before the law as uh, uh, the citizens in that country. And that's true. Article 6 is that foundational right upon which many of the remaining UDH articles depend on, rooted in recognition. Can you share a bit as well how does Franciscans International or other NGOs, you know, actualize this article? And what actions are you involved with to promote and protect human rights? As you can, as you can see that this article is very, very important. Uh, and it, as you mentioned uh, uh, rightly, that it becomes a kind of fundament for many other rights that have been translated into different uh, international uh, human right uh, norms, as uh, we all know that this article has also uh, been translated into uh, the Article 16 of the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and some other uh, uh, articles as well. And of course, it has also in inspired some other uh, regional mechanisms and national legislations and everything. Uh, and for us, uh, in terms of how to work on it, once again, we uh, try to use this article to make sure that everyone is equal, everyone is recognized, 
and in fact the the the, the challenges and the situations can uh, be different from from one place to another place uh, i just spoke uh, earlier regarding the situations of uh, people on the move uh, or migrants in uh, the situations like uh, in uh, Mexico, Honduras, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador. But at the same time, we are also faced with the situations of those who are seeking protections because of the conflict situations in their countries. And of course, uh, this happens in several uh, other places. Like for us, we've been uh, in touch with some people who have to move from Myanmar to uh, other places because of the current situation in Myanmar. Unfortunately, it's not only the current situations, but the situations that ha has been taking place in Myanmar for quite some time. So these people on the move or these people who are displaced forcibly because uh, the conflict situations, they also need to get uh, the protections. So they need to get the recognitions as well. Uh, and then we also understand that some people who uh, have uh, to move to other uh, situations because of their uh, uh, economic situations, such as the migrant workers, for example. Uh, some of the migrant workers uh, who have to move to uh, other countries because of the economic reasons, uh, often they do not also have the same recognitions before the law by the host country. They are treated as the uh, secondary citizens or secondary uh, uh, level in, in, in that law. So we are faced with so many situations in which this Article 6 is very much relevant in trying to uh, facilitate them and trying to help them so that they can uh, uh, be treated equally uh, in uh, the countries outside their country of origin. Well, those are excellent points. And you, you mentioned how Article 6 is also in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Maybe you could share a bit how Franciscans International operates in the human rights treaty bodies and helps bringing directly impacted people do country reviews as well as the optional protocols or other aspects around the Human Rights Council as that meeting takes place three, place, three times a year. And we know you're always able to facilitate side events and other ways for people to be able to participate and make sure their rights are realized. Thank you for that question, because uh, for us, as you mentioned, that the human right, uh, the UN human right mechanism has several uh, bodies and subsidiary bodies in which they provide the avenues for the affected communities to bring their concerns and try to put uh, the state accountable on their human rights situations. So we, as Franciscan International, we do uh, uh, work using, for example, the UN treaty bodies. And uh, for the Article 6 of the UDHR, for example, we use uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in which we make submissions uh, on the country-specific situations, and we try to uh, really bring the concerns of the people coming from that country that is being reviewed, and su make submissions to the UN uh, Human Rights Committee, so that the UN Human Rights Committee can see what are the obligations of the state that is being reviewed so that uh, the state can really guarantee a full implementation of that article and uh, the people on the ground can benefit from that uh, protections and implementations of that article. Just to give you an example, for the uh, ICCPR, for example, in the past, we uh, made submission on the human rights situations of the asylum seekers to Australia who uh, were detained uh, in Christmas Island, in Nauru, or in Papua New Guinea. So there are people uh, who seek protection from Australia. Unfortunately, they are uh, uh, confined in a detention center in a region that is considered outside Australia, like Christmas Island, but also in Nauru and Papua New Guinea. And when they are in those places, they are not given with the equal treatment. They are not recognized uh, in the same level before the Australian law. So for us, it is the violations of human rights uh, of uh, these people by the Australian government. So therefore, we made some submissions to the Human Rights Committee so that Australia can be uh, uh, reminded that they have the obligation to implement this Article 6 of the UDHR that has been uh, translated into Article 16, in which Australia uh, is a state party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political uh, Rights. Excellent. And when you look at that, maybe you could share with us a bit other NGOs that you see championing this important right and who are also creating culture of human rights 
around Article 6, and some of the major heroes or sheroes were around this right. And I guess the, the, this, this uh, Article 6 has inspired quite many people or quite many NGOs and civil society organizations, not only at the international level, but they are also at the national level, especially uh, the NGOs who are really working on the issue of the uh, human right, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, because the, one of the point of entries of the uh, Article uh, 6 of the UDHR or Article 16 of the ICCPR is indeed uh, the civil and political right perspective. And for this, there are so many uh, organizations uh, that, for example, on the issue of refugee and asylum seekers, we know several organizations, the one that I know quite well, for example, uh, in my network is Jesuit Refugee Service, in which they provide uh, 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 help for uh, the refugees to get the treatment. I know as well in Caritas, for example, in Caritas, they provide uh, protections and also uh, uh, facilitations to people that are disadvantage because of their situations. Uh, there are some other organizations in which they speak much more on the legal uh, 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 understanding of this article and uh, also to see how the national legislation should be able to really uh, uh, provide uh, protections based on the uh, articles uh, uh, 16 of UDHR. So there are some other organizations at the international level and um, I mean, organizations such as uh, Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International, if I may say that, uh, but also some regional uh, organizations such as Forum Asia or other organizations, they do uh, really work on those issues. But we have also to acknowledge that almost at all national level in our network, we understand that this article has been very much uh, important for them as well in their work. When you share with that, it really does remind me of the important work that Franciscans International has been doing around climate change and human rights. And we know our COP28 is just around the corner. Can you maybe share why climate change and human rights is so important and some of the activities that have been done to ensure that this right is ensured, as well as maybe the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment? Yes, indeed, because we know that the rights, uh, the different rights are very, very well connected to each other. So we cannot just look at the human rights only from one small article or another article, but there is uh, uh, a need to look at the uh, human rights as uh, uh, one in which we can approach it to a different level. So, for, exa for example, for us, uh, we, as Franciscan International, we think that the issue of climate change is part of our uh, focus, knowing that uh, it's part of the teams in which the Franciscans, uh, the network of the Franciscans everywhere, uh, think that it is our responsibility to care for the, the nature, the creations, uh, the environment that we have. Uh, as uh, This is uh, part of the charism of St. Francis and uh, St. Clair of Assisi, so it's important, it's a mandate for us. And uh, understanding the current challenge that we are facing now, climate change become one of the key issues that has been addressed uh, widely, including by the UN, when the Secretary General talked about the uh, triple uh, uh, planetary crisis, climate change is one of those uh, crises, those challenges. And for us, it's important for us uh, to work with the existing mechanisms, either by the UN Human Rights Council, by uh, the different treaty bodies, but as well as through uh, the COP, the Conference of Party, uh, to the uh, UN C, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we feel that these avenues are connected to each other. And as you right, um, uh, uh, rightly mentioned as well, the fact that uh, there is a global recognition of the right to have the environment, it becomes another avenue in which between uh, the issue between the recognition of human being as equal before law, being recognized uh, before law. At the same time, we know that uh, these people are being either displaced, discriminated because of their situations, including the situation on climate change. And then we think that uh, it is important to bring this issue to COP28 uh, so that there is a, ho a holistic approach to the situations. Just also to give you an, an, an example, uh, in, in the Pacific, you're coming from the Pacific, so you understand it quite well. On, on, on how the situations in some uh, small state and developing islands, uh, they are being threatened either by, by the uh, global warming, the rising, of, the rising of the sea level. At the same time, uh, we understand that in some countries, uh, such as Solomon Island, 
the numbers of uh, the locking is uh, increasing quite a lot because of the international demand. So that's uh, making us that, of course, because of that locking, the environment has been affected, the people have been affected, and it creates uh, uh, um, some crisis, human rights crisis, uh, of the communities uh, in that in that situations, and some of them are forced to be displaced to another uh, either island to or maybe in the future also to another country. So that's why we see the interconnectedness of this issue, and then uh, we think that we need to really use the different avenues so that the issue can be uh, really addressed in a more comprehensive and proper way. Uh, uh, just uh, an, another example uh, in, in the Pacific, we know that now uh, we start to think about what's going to happen with the so-called uh, climate refugee. And I think it is a challenge, although uh, uh, climate refugee has not been recognized internationally, but we understand it's something that is concrete, something that is real. And some of the Pacific states now are really taking uh, into account the, 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 the future of their country, of their uh, nations. And we need really to address because if the people from, for example, Tuvalu uh, has to move to another place, how will be the the, the their, their recognitions uh, uh, in this in, in the situations outside their country? So that's why the issue of climate change can also be seen as an avenue of advocacy of the people who will be displaced or who are already displaced by climate change to ensure that this Article Six uh, uh, of the UDHR is really respected uh, uh, in this particular situation. No, really comprehensive and appreciative appreciate the creativity as well to apply international human rights law to these emerging issues that maybe people don't fully understand. And also looking at COP28 and seeing how important it is around loss and damages, as well as making sure that people are directly impacted who had done the least amount to create these conditions of the climate crisis are then able to have access to funds to be able to make sure that, as you said, the large ocean nations are at the table representing their people and that's really one of the most important points because Article 6 guarantees the genuine recognition before the law for everyone everywhere on earth. And you pointed out really good points that under the Refugee Convention, that there is no such aspect. But we know there was just the 52nd Pacific Island Forum that took place in the Cook Islands. And we see Tuvalu being offered something from Australia that they haven't done in the past of 280 people able to move and migrate to Australia. So we do see there are changes, but we also know we're dealing with conditions and circumstances with the climate emergency that have never really been faced before, certain legal questions around self-determination, boundaries, and the continuation of an entire country, of that ancestral wisdom being able to still be in place and to govern and take care of their own people. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned very uh, rightly about this new development in which uh, uh, looking at uh, how the, 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 the states respond, uh, there are some positive signs. And we have to acknowledge that, that there are some positive signs. And of course, there are some frustrations, especially uh, from our side as human rights defenders. But the positive side uh, signs, as, as you mentioned, the issue of Tuvalu. If uh, Australia is genuine in welcoming these climate refugees, and then it, it, it's going to set up uh, 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 either jurisprudence or precedence in, in which uh, the states also uh, acknowledge of the situations uh, and also take actions in providing uh, the protections for those who are displaced or those who have to migrate because of the climate change issues. And I think this example has to be put into uh, the discussions uh, in uh, COP28, uh, uh, in which the issue of loss and damage has to be uh, uh, taken, has to take into account this kind of situations. Because as you mentioned, they cost the least in terms of climate change, but they are one of the first to be concretely affected. So I think these people need to have uh, the voice, need to be heard, and then the the, the, the decision making uh, process in 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 uh, uh, COP28 should really put this, these concrete cases at the center of the discussions and trying to uh, put aside uh, uh, this a kind of understanding that it's only about numbers, it's only about you know the uh, coma or this and the negotiations, but keep always in mind the affected communities as the center of the discussions. And it is our task as civil society 
to ensure that these different mechanisms should not work in silos. They have to be connected. And uh, just why you, including us, we work on the issue of the human rights uh, perspective of the climate negotiations, and precisely the example of Tuvalu, the, the, the example of the uh, uh, climate displacement, it is uh, uh, human rights issues, and it is uh, uh, the obligations that the climate action should take uh, the human rights approach in addressing this uh, type of uh, negative impact of climate change to the well-being of uh, the, uh, the people. It's true, and as you see, the we're on the eve of this COP28, and we know there's a whole bunch of bigger negotiations coming up around Brazil hosting it, and also potentially Australia and having a Pacific COP in a way, this conference of parties. We're at a point where that recognition as a person is so essential, and we can see this with the challenges we're facing with our planet today. Maybe you could share with us a bit what is your vision for the future of this important right? Yes, uh, I think we need really to uh, uh, first put the affected communities at the center of advocacy. That's uh, uh, important. But also to let those who are affected to speak for themselves. So it's quite important for those who are affected to speak uh, for themselves. And I do believe that this article uh, uh, six of the UDHR will be very important uh, uh, in our discussions regarding the climate crisis or the, uh, the triple planetary crisis, because uh, at the international level, there will be some uh, legal questions. No? What will be the status of these people? Uh, how to uh, understand the right to self-determination in the context of climate crisis or uh, triple planetary crisis? or uh, how uh, uh, the understanding of a nation uh, in the future regarding uh, you know, the, the, the international law. And uh, since the um, Geneva Convention on Refugee doesn't recognize uh, the issue of uh, um, climate refugee, that will be another question. So in my understanding, uh, uh, the interpretations of uh, Article 6 of UDHR will be very, very crucial. And of course, it should be translated into uh, as I said, Article 16 of the uh, ICCPR, in uh, addressing the global uh, situations now, uh, in particular, if we are talking about the triple uh, planetary crisis. So it will be very, very important uh, to remind uh, uh, the policymakers, but also to remind us as the uh, human rights defenders to go back again on the importance of Article 6 of the UDHR. So it's a, a crucial as part of the uh, main considerations to ensure that uh, uh, as you said, everyone everywhere, uh, we have the equal uh, uh, opportunity. It really reminds me too, the way you describe it, it's putting a face on the climate crisis. It's making sure that people then know exactly who's being impacted and why. And it would be even better if we could trace the carbon, but it really does point out that this is really the people who are being most impacted and more importantly, what we, the global community have as a responsibility under international human rights law to be able to assist going forward. Yes, I, I, I support you very much. And, and uh, that's why for, for us, uh, although COP28 has not taken place yet, but we are uh, a little bit of uh, uh, alarm on the fact that some of the negotiators, they mixed up between their position as a negotiator and their position to represent some interest like the corporate interest. That is worrying for us because I think we need to be very clear that people has to be at the center. Uh, people has to speak for themselves and the negotiators, the decisions of COP28 has to put face on this uh, uh, reality. And I guess uh, uh, the civil society has mobilized uh, ourselves to uh, influence this process. Although, of course, uh, the fact that uh, uh, COP28 is taking place in, in Dubai, we are not very sure on the civic space, uh, on the possibility for us to really uh, exercise our right, right of uh, uh, expressions, freedom of expression, freedom of associations. It's a challenging situation. But uh, the underline is that we will never give up. We will continue to uh, speak up 
on behalf of the people and as the people and we make sure that people's voice will be heard in the decision making process and that our right to uh, participate in the decision making process should be respected and should be guaranteed including in uh, our uh, uh, work to ensure that uh, article 6 of the UDSR is uh, impl implemented and respected effectively. It's true. The UDHR does call for equality and equity, beginning with the right to recognition as a person endowed from birth before the law. And that equal recognition protection is central to all rights enshrined in the UDHR. Maybe you can take us down some potential paths to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights on the ground and around the globe as we go forward. Yes, I think uh, we need uh, really in terms of advocacy, we need to uh, help the community uh, or those who are marginalized to understand uh, in uh, in a very simple uh, language the fact that they have uh, the, the right, that it is the responsibility of the state to fulfill that right, regardless if that state is their state of origin or they, the state where they uh, leave because of uh, the different uh, factors, as we, as we said. But I think it's very important to let the people know that they have this right, uh, regardless of their uh, uh, situations, because uh, everyone is really equal before law. And then we need as civil as civil society, as uh, human rights defenders, we uh, need to work together hand in hand with, with them. It's true. And even in another space that people don't normally put the two together, there is the annual forum on business and human rights, which will take place soon in Geneva. Maybe you could give us a taste of what it's like to participate in this forum on business and human rights and why it's so important to guarantee that the voice of the peoples is heard in that important space. Exactly. The forum is taking place at the very moment, starting from today until the day after tomorrow, so today's forum. And uh, in this kind of forum, what is very important for us is about the corporate uh, accountability, that the corporate should be accountable on their uh, human right uh, 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 compliance. And for us, we, we also work on the issue of the legally binding instrument because we would like uh, the corporate to be accountable internationally so that they should respect human rights and their conduct should be accountable to make sure that the community, uh, uh, the people, uh, their rights should be respected. So that's very important for us that we engage in the discussions and we push for the international legally binding instrument so that uh, any abuses done by a corporate should be uh, accountable uh, before law, should be accountable uh, and compliant with the international human rights obligation. No, that's a really good point because Franciscans International were very involved in the drafting of the guiding principles on business and human rights and their national action plans has been a step, but it's great that you're pointing out why a new treaty is so important going forward. Exactly. So for us, we are really pushing for the international legally binding treaty on business and human rights, indeed. That's excellent. As we look to going to that space, we know that if we did get a binding treaty, that would then provide the space to make sure that people can make sure their rights are upheld. If a corporation's doing the wrong thing, if it's a climate crisis, if it's a country, it covers all aspects. Indeed. And by the end of the day, it is the, the obligation of state. State is the duty bearer. So it means that the state has to uh, uh, enforce uh, uh, the corporate to be compliant with the international human rights norms. So the role of state is still very important. And it is the state that has the obligations or they ha that has the duty to ensure that the corporate uh, that uh, take place in their state or other states should be compliant with the international human rights obligation. And we are we are really fighting for, for that together with uh, the communities, with the different civil society organizations, with the indigenous people organizations, people movements. So we mobilize everyone so that uh, um, we uh, uh, can really establish this international legally binding instrument uh, to protect peoples from the corporate abuses. Udi, thank you so much for your time, and we very much appreciate all the efforts of Franciscans International. Aloha. Thank you very much. Bye.